Amen. All right, let's get loud with praise for the Lord. Wow, you guys don't know what loud means. Let's get loud with praise for the Lord. Come on. There we go. Okay, how many of you have ever known somebody that you felt was uh, married to their work? Right? Anybody. Maybe it was you. Right? We've all been there. And when, when we say in our culture that somebody's married to their work, oftentimes that's not really a compliment. But today, we're actually going to talk about a type of work that you should be married to, and it is, um, it, it is a compliment. It is a good thing for us. So before we go on, though, let me just stop and say good morning. Welcome to Harvest Bible Chapel, North Iowa. Um, for all of our visitors, my name is Pastor Terry, and whether you're joining us here in person or if you're joining us online, we really do love that you are here to, to worship with us. Okay? If for some reason I haven't met you, I'll be out in our lobby after the service. Um, I'll be in our welcome area, so please come up and introduce yourself. I'd love to get a chance to meet you. Uh, if you are joining us online, give us a call throughout the week, uh, even if it's over the phone. I'd love to get a chance to meet you. So, okay, let's go ahead and do what we do every week and open up our, our Bibles. That's right. We're continuing on in our series entitled, I Am, notice small I am, yours, capital yours, right? Meaning I am, we are, say we, meaning we are saying that we are yours, God. Okay? That's what the title of the series means. And even though our series is a topical series, we do have a theme verse. That theme verse is Colossians 1.16. And before we get into this too much, I just want to kind of give any of our visitors a little bit of a backstory. I, I asked our church at the beginning of this series, what words would you use to define yourself? What words would you use to define yourself? And I told you I've been excited about this series because even though I can't give you all the exact words that you should use to define yourself, I am in Colossians 1.16 and some other verses through this series um, trying to show you two concepts to define yourself by that will change your life forever if you let it. And so let's go ahead and take a look at our theme verse. Again, Colossians 1.16, it says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things, say all, all things were created through him and for him. And so here's the, the two concepts that we're basing this whole series off of. It's this right here. All things were created through him and for him, right? And so everything that we're talking about in this series falls under one of these two categories. And Colossians 1.16, the fact that you were created for Christ changes the way that you should define who you are. See, if I can convince you to believe that you were created for Christ and through Christ, it... Uh, if I can convince you to believe that, it will bring great understanding into your life. Anybody for understanding? Understand? Okay, that's what I thought, right? But if I can convince you to live like you were created through Christ and for Christ, then it will absolutely change everything about your life. Amen? Right? So our main, main point for this series has been this. Be who you were created to be. You were created for Christ. So be who you were created to be. And this is super important because how we define ourselves really is less important than how God defines us. One of, if not the most important answers that you can find in life is this, who am I? Right? We already talked about defining yourself as um, being God's created, um, being God's redeemed, Last week, we talked about how we are God's adopted. We're his adopted child, adopted into the, the family of God through Christ Jesus. I thought I'd get at least one amen on that one. Adopted into the family of God through Christ Jesus, right? And so this week, we're talking about being workers. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at our text. So open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. We're going to be in chapter 15. We're actually looking at one verse today, 
It's verse 58. So 1 Corinthians 15, 58, it says this. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Okay, let me, uh, let me break this down for you a little bit, okay? So the text starts off with um, writing to our beloved brothers. And here's the main point that Paul's going to write to these Corinthians. It's this right here. Be steadfast, right? So my beloved brothers, be steadfast. That's the, the command in the text. And then the supporting part of that is always abounding in the work of the Lord. Be steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Right? There's a couple things to recognize. First of all, he says, my brothers. Therefore, my brothers. Right? This is my brothers and sisters. Right? But he is writing to believers in the church. He's writing to the believers in the church, those who have truly put their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and can truly honestly say, I am yours. Right? He's not just writing to the religious leaders in the church. Right? It's to all the believers at the church in Corinth. And he says, be steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Okay, now a couple other things. First of all, Paul is not saying in any way that we are saved by our works, right? We're not saved by our works. But as Ephesians chapter 2 teaches us, even though we're not saved by our works, we are saved with the intention and the thought that there is going to be works that is produced by us because of our salvation in Jesus Christ. Okay, so not saved by works, but actually saved for works. Works, which the text says, God already prepared for you to do beforehand. Before you were ever saved, before you were ever born, God intended for you to do some works. And so really what it is, it's not, it's not that we're saved by works, but it's that works is evidence that someone can honestly say, I am yours, Lord. And that's what we're talking about through this series. So our main point for today is this. Dedicate yourself to constantly working for the Lord. Now, if you're here today and you're like, but I've, I don't know if I'm there. Like, I, don't, I don't know if I've really made Jesus Lord of my life. I'm, I'm not sure where I'm at at that yet. Hey, can I, this is still for you. Hey, this is still written to you as well and for you. And we are glad that you're here. But this is for you. Say it's for me. Right, this is for all of us, okay? Dedicate yourself to constantly working for the Lord. And as we go forward, I want you to see four key ideas about the work of the Lord, right? Four key ideas about the work of the Lord that I want you to know. Since we've already prayed for our service, if you're ready to read on, say let's read. All right, here we go. Four key ideas about the work of the Lord to know. Here's number one. Number one is that it's a worthy work. Let's look back at our text. It says this. Therefore, my beloved brothers, we're going to stop. We didn't get very far, did we? There's one real key word that I want you to see here. It's the word therefore. Any time in Scripture you say, as I've taught you before, any time in Scripture you see the word therefore, we need to stop and we need to find out what it's there for. Right? So what Paul is writing when he transitions and says therefore, he's writing a transition from what he was just teaching the believers in Corinth, and what he was just teaching them was that Jesus Christ had given us victory over sin and death. Jesus Christ had given us victory over sin and death. It says it's given as a gift. The, the idea there is that it's a guarantee. In other words, God had guaranteed our victory over sin and death through our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Clap or something. Come on. Give me something. Come on. We should be excited about this. I don't know about you, but you guys know I like to win. So when I see the word victory, I get excited. He's guaranteed our victory over sin and death. And therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast abounding in the work of the Lord. That's what Paul is transitioning to here, which is why I say it's so important for us to know that this work, it's a worthy work. 
Right? That's what Paul's saying when he says, therefore. Verse 57, Paul finishes off that idea. He says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. Then he goes on to say, therefore, in my own summary, dedicate yourself to constantly working for the Lord. In other words, it's not primarily the work that is worthy. Hear this. It's the one that we're working for who is worthy. Amen? That's where the worthiness comes in. And there's a, a lot of debate these days about who the, the goats are in this world. You guys know what that means? Right? Anybody under 20 for sure knows what that reference means. If you don't, when someone refers to someone as a goat, it means greatest of all time. So our, our world loves to, to, be, to debate who the greatest of all time is. So they'll debate about um, who the greatest basketball player of all time is, which is ridiculous because obviously it's Michael Jordan. They're, they'll debate about who the, the greatest baseball player of all time is or what the, the greatest baseball team of all time is. They'll debate about who the greatest football player of all time is. Nobody wants to talk about that unless you live in New England or Tampa. They'll debate about who the greatest president of all time is. They'll debate about who the greatest actor or actress of all time is. They'll, de they'll debate about who the greatest singer of all time is. But listen, when it comes to the one who is truly worthy, there is no debate about who the greatest mankind, the, person, the greatest human who ever lived in history is. There is no debate about it. Jesus Christ is was God and man at the same time. All-powerful, yet sacrificed for the creation that he created, but who rejected him by coming and living sacrificially, living to serve us, dying voluntarily, and then, here it is, you ready? Ready? Are you ready? Raising, rising victoriously over sin and death so that you could rise victoriously over sin and death. Amen? There is no debate about who the greatest human to ever live is. Now some might say, but I don't really know that I believe that. I don't know that I'm there yet. Maybe, maybe you're here and you don't, you don't know that you believe that Jesus is actually God who came as the Savior of the world. That he died on a cross for the forgiveness of the sins of mankind. Maybe you're not there. You may, maybe you might actually say, I actually might debate who the greatest human is. I'll just say this. That might be how you feel now. But as scripture teaches us. I'll give you an example out of Philippians chapter 4. It says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In other words, one day he's coming again or you're going to meet him and you're going to stand before the holy and righteous king. Actually, you're probably not going to stand before the holy and the righteous king. You will probably hit the ground on your knees in worship and for sure every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In other words, we're all going to confess that he is the goat. And I just realized how weak of an example that was to call Jesus the goat. But he is the greatest of all time. Amen? Jesus is worthy of your work. That's where the worthy comes in. Okay. Four key ideas about the work of the Lord. One, know it's a, it's a worthy work. Here's number two. Know that it takes dedication. Let's look back at our text. It says this. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and immovable. These are two strong, strong words. Be steadfast and immovable. So here we have these two strong words. They're very similar, but slightly different. Both of them have the idea of standing firm, being immovable, right? Being settled and having a firm foundation, not being moved around or pushed around. It's that I'm solid, I'm in my place. They both have that idea. But to be steadfast, 
And to be immovable, here's, here's what I really um, believe it fully means. It means to be steadfast and immovable in faith and in our work. Because it's talking about abounding in the work of the Lord. So being steadfast, it's being steadfast in our faith in Jesus Christ, in our trust in Jesus Christ. Not, not sometimes I'm in with this whole Jesus thing, and when it's more difficult, maybe I'm not quite as in on this whole Jesus thing. Sometimes I trust in him and sometimes I don't. No, it's I am settled. I am steadfast in this, standing firm in my faith in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior for salvation and for life. And then being immovable. And the idea of being immovable, it's actually a little bit stronger of a word than being steadfast. It comes with a reference of being immovable even in the face of great odds and danger, it means no matter what you face, no matter what kind of persecution, no matter what kind of struggle you face, it's being immovable in the work and faith of the Lord. All right, we're a lake town here, so some of you guys might get this. Our family used to have a boat, right? Let me see if I can illustrate this a little bit. Our family used to have a boat, and I used to love to go out in the middle of the lake and, like, just, just drift, like, I just want to see, let's just see where the waves take me, right? And I know you guys who know me, this probably seems strange. Like, I don't see you as that guy. But it was fun just to go out and sit and drift, and it was really great when the waters were fairly calm. But when storms came, and when the waters got rough, not such a great idea, right? So I used to love to just drift in the waves until that time comes, but this is not what we're supposed to be in life. We're not supposed to be those who say we're Christians drift, just drifting along aimlessly in life. James 1 and Ephesians chapter 4, it teaches us that we are not to be tossed around by the waves of doubt or bad teaching or the waves of the world, but instead we need to be anchored. Anchored in the things of God. And listen, if you want to abound in the work of the Lord, you will need to be anchored in and dedicated to standing immovable in the work of the Lord. Immovable. Never, um, never, never, um, never persuaded away from the things of God. Um, always undistracted, undeterred, undiscouraged. For the work of the Lord. Never allowing ourselves to be pulled away from the work. No matter what we face. Steadfast. Immovable. Whether it's just our friends thinking that we're a little strange. Right? I, I mean, let's just be honest. I'm just a little strange anyway. A little obnoxious. Whether it's just our friends thinking we're a little strange. Or whether it's the attacks from hell and the devil himself, we must remain dedicated. That's what it means to be steadfast and immovable. Intentionally dedicated to remain in the work of the Lord. And I'm sure someone might be thinking, that sounds way too hard. <laughs> I don't know if I thought I was signing up for that one. But be encouraged, Matthew 28 said, Jesus, after he gets through telling the disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, he says this, and I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. In other words, I will be there to strengthen you to do this. I will be there to give you the endurance to persevere through this. And in the scripture, it also teaches us that it's those who endure in this faith that can truly, honestly say, I am yours, Lord. Amen? So to abound in the work of the Lord, it takes dedication. And again, it's only those who stand firm and endure until the end who can confidently define themselves as workers and say, I am yours. All right, so it's a worthy work. It's a work that takes dedication. Here's number three. Number three is this, it's an always and forever work. Okay, let's look back at the text. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always about, what's that word? Always, say it with me, always abounding in the work of the Lord. <laughs> okay, 
So let me ask you this. How, how many of you ha- are planners in here? How many of you are planners? Or like you like knowing exactly what it is that you're doing all the time? Yeah, a few of us. How about like your half planners? I'm kind of a half planner. My mornings are really planned out, and then my afternoons are like way loose. Anybody else? Okay, so I want you to think about that for a second, because it really kind of gives us an idea here. Listen, this idea of um, this work being an always forever work, it's very similar to what we just talked about, except that in the last point, the focus was on being dedicated to the work of the Lord, being dedicated no matter what we face to the work of the Lord. And now the emphasis switches to being dedicated to the work of the Lord always and forever. And I have these certain things that are for sure planned out in my life, right? My alarm goes off at the same time. I hit snooze the same amount of times. I'm the snooze guy. I hit snooze the same amount of time. I get up, I go to the gym, then I have my devotion time, then I have my sermon time. Those times are set out and planned ahead. And if you're like that and kind of like me in that way, I could just picture someone being like, okay, bottom line this for me. Like how much time do I have to plan for this whole working in the Lord thing? You get where I'm going with this? Like just like what's the minimum that I have to plan into my schedule every day of working for the Lord so that I'm kind of like getting by? Okay, what's that minimum that I have to be? So here's the answer to that. Um, All day, every day, and for the rest of your life. All day long, we are supposed to be thinking about and living out the work of the Lord. So when you go home today, everybody go to your Google schedules and your calendars and just schedule in working for the Lord and just put it 24 hours and repeat it every day. That's what we're called to. Every day for the rest of our lives. Meaning, there is no retiring from the work of the Lord. And this work is supposed to be done at all times, every day, all day long. Whew, does that sound exhausting? Some of you might be thinking, there's no way. Like, even if I um, become a pastor or become a missionary, like, even if I was to do that, I... Like, i got to have rest sometimes. Like there's, got, like, there's no way I can always accomplish this, always be working for the Lord. Well, first of all, that's kind of part of the idea. Reminds us that we can't do this on our own, amen? That we are supposed to turn to the Lord constantly for help. But also, some good news, that's not what it means. That's not actually what it means. 1 Corinthians 10, though, in Colossians 3, teaches us that whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. In other words, not everyone needs to quit their jobs and then go get a job in full-time ministry, being a pastor or a missionary. Not everyone needs to do that. That doesn't mean that some of you might not need to do that. And our hope here is that we would be sending out more pastors and we would be sending out more missionaries. Right? Not that we want you to leave, but we will happily support you going open-handedly to do the work of the Lord. Right? But that's not what it means for everyone. But what it does mean is that you should dedicate whatever it is that God has called you to do to the work of the Lord. In other words, when you're out Christmas shopping this season, <laughs> you're out buying your Christmas gifts as a work for the Lord out of your love and passion for whoever it is that you're serving. That means even when you are dealing with difficult checkout people or other difficult shoppers, you're there not out of spite, not because you have to be. You're there doing the work of the Lord, loving on people and serving people. Maybe you work retail. Great. Love and serve those people the way Jesus Christ would love and serve those people if he was doing what you were doing. Maybe you work at the school, or maybe you homeschool, you're at home. Hey, love those kids and work and serve those kids the way Jesus Christ would love on and serve those kids. Maybe you do car sales or real estate. Whatever it is that you do, always with a heart for the work of the Lord, for the glory of God. Amen? 
That's what it means to always be about the work of the Lord. The Bible also says to, to pray without ceasing. It's the same concept and same idea. Our hearts and our minds are always set, whatever we're doing, on glorifying God. How is this the work of the Lord? Amen? To abound in the work of the Lord, it takes an always forever dedication. No stopping, no retiring. And then here's the last one. If you're still with me, say with you. All right, number four is this. It's a rewarding work. It's a rewarding work. We'll try it again. It's a rewarding work. Amen? Four key ideas about the work of the Lord to know. Number four, know it's a rewarding work. Look at the text. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Amen? It's a rewarding work. All right, how many of you have ever put a lot of work into something that just didn't turn out to be quite as fruitful or rewarding as you thought it was going to be, right? Um, if you're a Vikings fan, just go ahead and put your hands up and leave them up, right? All of us have experienced this, putting a little bit extra work into something, maybe a little bit extra emotion or attention, and it didn't turn out quite the way that we thought it would or thought it should. That will never be the case with anything that you do in obedience with a heart of doing it for the Lord. That will never be the case. Never. The Lord has promised that anything that you do, any work, any act that you do with a true heart, as a true Christ follower, with a true desire to do it for His glory and to please Him, any of it, will be rewarded. It will be rewarded. Whether it's in this life or for sure in eternity, and that should be a great hope for you. It's a great hope for me. It's a great encouragement. It can help give us a, a great spark to stay dedicated in abounding in this work of the Lord. Someone here may be thinking, yeah, but that's not really why we're supposed to work for the Lord. Like we're supposed to do things out of a love for the Lord. And to that I would say, yes, you are correct. That is absolutely the reason why we serve the Lord. It's out of a love for Him. He loved us first, amen? And out of our love for Him and our thankfulness and our gratefulness for what He's done, we serve Him. But there's a reason that He put it in the Scriptures. There's still some great rewards, y'all. And it should still be a great hope for us. He wants it. Out of his love for us, he wants us to be encouraged by the great promises of the great rewards, the great inheritance that we talked about last week as true children of God. This should be super exciting for us. It is his desire that we would be excited and passionate about what he has promised for us about the hope of a future that we have when we put our faith in Jesus Christ and when we stand firm and serve Him and work for Him no matter what we face and when we endure to the end those promises of a, of a great inheritance that we talk about all the time. And I, I, can't, I can't define it. I can't explain it to you other than to use the word. It's going to be awesome awesome it will be awesome no more fear no more pain no more heartache no more struggle no more sickness the promise of a of a beautiful eternity in the presence of God where there will always always say always always be love and joy and happiness the love of a perfect father who loves perfectly Guys, it's a rewarding work. And it's a work that we are called to define ourselves by. That's what we're talking about, right? Through this series, what words would you use to define yourself? We were created for Christ. We were created 
to be his. Since the beginning of time, he's been working this plan to have a people of his own, a people that he could love and bless, and a people that would love and bless him. And one of the ways we do that is by being steadfast and abounding in the work of the Lord. Amen?